So within plants, we have four, I guess I'm trying to think of the best word to describe it, four categories of plants based on kind of some key characteristics of those plants. Now within each of these categories, we'll talk about one phyla within it. Some of these categories have multiple phyla, some only have one, and I'll kind of clarify that, but it's really not that big of a deal. And so the first group of plants, the most primitive and probably the first ones to evolve are the seedless non-vascular plants. And this picture is actually a close-up of some of those guys. So the organism that we're gonna focus on within the seedless non-vascular plants is phylum bryophyta. And see that phyta, remember phyta means plant-like. These include our mosses. So that's what you saw in the first picture and that's what you see in this picture as well. So as the name implies, it's seedless, so they don't have seeds, which sometimes is kind of difficult to imagine because we always think of seeds with plants, but well, obviously some plants do have seeds, not all of them do. And we'll talk about how they reproduce if they don't have seeds. They're also considered non-vascular plants. Now, maybe you're pulling some information back from protists. And I said the difference between algae and plants is that plants have vascularization while algae don't. But I just call this a non-vascular plant, so why is it a plant and not algae? Although bryophytes don't have true vascular tissue, they do have a primitive type vascular tissue. We're gonna learn about the fully developed vascular tissue in our next group of plants. But the primitive or, or kind of simple vascular tissue that bryophytes have is they do have cells that move, but move water and move nutrients. Actually, most of their cells can do so. Their cells essentially have pores in them and water from one cell can move to another cell that can move to another cell, so on and so forth. But that's not a very efficient system. It, honestly, it's a very slow system. And so because it's slow and it's not very efficient, this actually limits the size that organisms in phylum bryophyta and really in just the seedless non-vascular plants, it limits the size that they can get to because they don't have a quick way of moving water through the plant. Now, something that's also kind of different about our mosses and our other seedless non-vascular plants is they actually don't even have roots. So they have this structure called rhizoids and it's very easy to mistake them for roots. We'll explore roots more in a little bit, but in general, roots have two functions. One, they anchor the plant. They literally root the plant in the soil. The second function of roots is to absorb water. But rhizoids, which again are found in our mosses, rhizoids, which kind of look like roots, they're found at the bottom, the only thing they do is anchor the plant. So they're only going to anchor that moss to that log, to that soil, to that tree, to that rock. So they only anchor. They do not do any kind of water or nutrient absorption like roots do. So these plants still have to get water and they still have to get nutrients. And so most of that is actually happening in the leaves or essentially the green part of the moss. Uh, so it does happen. It's just, it's happening in other parts of the plant. So again, this is kind of, kind of a, a bit different than what we see uh, with the rest of the plants we'll talk about. And again, because they can get water and they can move it around the plant, that's why it gets considered a plant and not an algae. It's just not a very fast and efficient process. So that results in a, a limitation in how large the plant can get because they have to ensure that they're able to get water and nutrients to all parts of the plant. I know, you're just pausing, you're like, oh my God. Um, so when we're looking at the fungal life cycles, the fungal life cycles are a little bit easier and a lot less keywords. Uh, and our plant cycles, are bigger. But I will say what is nice about the plant life cycles is as long as you've learned alternation of generations, gametophytes make gametes, gametes make a sporophyte, sporophytes make spores, spores grow into gametophytes. If you can remember that, you'll remember all of this and you're like, there's no way in the world I'm going to remember all of this. You will. Students have done it before. Students will do it again. So you, you got this. I'm also going to give you the heads up before we talk about this on the test or on a quiz or on an assignment, I am not gonna leave you in the dark. And what I mean by that is I'm not going to ask the question, describe the moss life cycle, period. No, the way I would ask it is describe the moss life cycle. 
be sure to include the words gametophyte, the male and female, the gametes, egg and sperm, include archegonia, antheridia, zygotes, sporophytes, spores, meiosis. So I will give you the key words to kind of help jog your memory. Uh, and then hopefully having those words, you're like, oh, <laughs> I got this. Similar to what we saw with fungi. I'm going to show you this life cycle, but I'm actually just going to draw it. And as I'm drawing it, uh, we'll talk about some of the things that are in these red boxes. Uh, so I will talk about these red boxes in the context of this life cycle. So I am going to go ahead and open up my screen so that we can draw this together. As before, when drawing, I encourage you to actually write notes, like what is actually happening at all of these different levels. Now, I'm going to tell you right now, my drawing is not going to be as nice, like, circular cycle as you saw in the previous slide. So this is where the slide, like, you know, might be a little bit better, and I'm not going to take offense to that. So I am going to start with moss. Like, you look at moss, let's talk about what part of the life cycle that moss is. So I'm going to actually use green here. Oh, come on, turn on. There we go. So here's my green moss. And I'm purposely drawing like two uh, sprigs of green moss. And you wouldn't know this yet, so I'm just going to go ahead and write it out. The green moss that you see is the gametophyte. So both of these two sprigs of green moss is the gametophyte. If you recall from the alternation of generations, the gametophyte is haploid. Actually, the only thing in the alternation of generations that's diploid is the sporophyte. So if you can remember that sporophyte is diploid, everything else is haploid. So just memorize sporophyte diploid, and then any other keyword you see, likely going to be haploid. So when you guys are looking at moss, you are looking at the gametophyte form of that plant which is kind of cool. You can actually see it. Now think about it. Gametophyte. What does a gametophyte make? It makes gametes. And so this is why I drew two different sprigs. Think about humans. When we make gametes, you have females that make the egg, which is one of the gametes, and you have males that make sperm. So they have in humans, we have a male and female creating the egg and sperm. And we actually see that as well when it comes to our mosses. So when we look at this gametophyte, I'm just going to, it doesn't really matter. We're going to call this one the male and this one the female. So we have a male gametophyte is going to make a male gamete. And we have a female gametophyte that's going to make the female gamete. So I'm going to zoom in because this is going to be at the microscopic level. So I'm going to, I'm going to zoom in a little bit. I'm going to zoom in and kind of move this drawing over here. And I'm going to start with the male. No particular reason. I'm just starting with the male. And let me get to green again. If we were to zoom in on one of the little leaflets that are on this moss, we would see a structure like this. And then... All, I'm kind of coloring in green, just saying, like, this is all part of the plant. And within this structure, I'm trying to think of the colors I want to be using right now. I'm going to draw these. I'll talk about what this is in just a second. And then let's label it. So this structure that is found on the male gametophyte, this kind of bump type thing, this bump uh, type thing is called the antheridium. This antheridium is just part of the gametophyte. It is just a structure on the gametophyte. So the antheridium, haploid. Now inside of this antheridium, all that orangey, brown, yellow, whatever color that is, that I drew was sperm. That is the male gamete. So within the antheridium, we find the male gamete, sperm. So I'm going to go ahead and label this sperm. Sperm, just like in humans, is haploid. Nothing crazy has happened. We had a haploid gametophyte inside a haploid antheridium, now making haploid sperm. Below this, I'm just going to write gamete just as a reminder. Gametophytes make gametes. The very specific gametophyte being made is sperm. And again, this is haploid. 
Okay, so there's our sperm. Let's go ahead and just, let's talk about, talk about the ladies now. So we're going to do the same thing as at a microscopic level. So I'm going to zoom into one of these leaflets. I'm going to use green just to represent like, hey, we're look, still looking at a leaflet. The structure actually looks pretty similar to what we see in males. And let's use, oh, we'll use the same color. But you'll notice what's growing inside of it looks a little bit different. So this structure, again in males, was the antheridium. In females, this structure is called the archegonia. The archegonia is just a structure on the gametophyte. The gametophyte is haploid, so therefore the archegonia is haploid. This single structure found inside of this archegonia, you probably have guessed it, is the egg. And the egg is haploid. And again, as a reminder, the egg is a gamete, also haploid. I'm going to put this in, in human terms, because sometimes that helps, because you might know humans better. So we have a male. The male has testes. The testes make sperm. So here we have a male gametophyte that has an antheridium. The antheridium makes sperm. Here we have a female. In humans, they have an ovary. Inside the ovary is an egg. Or here, the female gametophyte has an archegonia that has a single egg. So very similar. It's kind of analogous uh, here to humans. Here's the problem, though. It's cool. We've got this sperm. We've got this egg. And sperm needs to get to egg. However, we're on land, right? If this was underwater, there would be no problem here. But we do have a problem because egg and sperm uh, are, are not in water. Egg and sperm are now on land, and so we have an issue. What we find in mosses, this is also going to be true in ferns. I'll mention it again when we talk about ferns. What we see in mosses, mosses depend on water for their reproductive cycle. Um, that's shown on the regular slide. I don't want to draw it on here yet just because I want to make sure we have room. But again, mosses depend on water for their reproductive cycle. This is an artifact of how they evolved. Remember, with evolution, these guys were protists that were in water. And so here we still have a dependency of water. We were able to move to land, but they're not 100% independent of water yet. So in wet conditions, which think about where you find moss. You find moss on forest floors, particularly damp forest floors. You see moss growing on rocks and logs that are near creeks. Uh, so mosses grow in wetter areas because of this requirement. If they're going to get their sperm to egg, they need that water. So that's what I'm going to draw. I'm going to say there was a, a nice morning dew. There's water just kissing the leaves of moss. Um, and as they're doing that, so I have blue just kind of representing water drops. And what will happen inside of these water drops, oh, that's a six. <laughs> so here's my water drops. And then what happens is as water drops go over the antheridium, the sperm, which are swimming sperm, just like human sperm, the sperm are literally going to swim into these water drops. And these water drops move, and they move, and if, if Lady Luck is on their side, some of that water that has this swimming sperm in it, some of this water is going to go over an archegonia. An archegonia that has a nice, mature egg just waiting, waiting for a sperm to fertilize it. And so that's what we end up seeing here. So we have this sperm in here that can now swim, literally swim to that egg to... Uh, in order to uh, reproduce with that egg and, and to fertilize that egg. So I'm going to draw, I'm going to kind of redraw parts of this. Uh, I'm just trying to think of the best way I want to do this. Let's, let's get our moss again. So I'm going to draw this a little bit more exaggerated. So this is a zoom in of the female moss. So this is the female gametophyte. On this female gametophyte, again, this is microscopic, but I'm drawing it larger for the purpose of what I'm going to do next. So here's that archegonia. Inside of that archegonia, um, I'm going to use red to represent, this is now a fertilized egg. This egg 
had or a sperm found that egg, a sperm fertilized with that egg. We now have a zygote hanging out in our archegonia. So our zygote, haploid or diploid? Hopefully you said diploid because we had an egg and a sperm come together. They came together, they fused, they are now a diploid organism or a diploid zygote. So let's, let's kind of put this in terms of our alternation of generations. So we started off with a gametophyte. Our gametophyte creates gametes. In this case, the sperm, which was growing in the antheridium, and the egg growing in the archegonia. The sperm found the egg and fertilized the egg and created the zygote. So this zygote is gonna start growing. So I'm gonna draw, actually, uh, let's use a different color real quick. Let's, yeah, let's use this brown color because it actually is brown in real life. So the zygote starts growing and it grows something that looks like this. Now, without me telling you anything, hopefully you know what structure is being drawn because we had gametophytes make gametes. Gametes grow into something and that something is the sporophyte. So this whole structure that's growing out of the zygote, this is the sporophyte. And remember the sporophyte is the stage that is diploid. So we have gametophytes making gametes. Gametes come together and create the sporophyte. And then can you remember what happens next? The sporophyte is gonna create the spores. Now, similar to actually um, in fungi, phylum zygomycota, very similar to that is at the end of the sporophyte is a structure. That structure is called the sporangium. And I know, it, it, in some ways, it's awesome that they use a lot of the same words as the fungal life cycle. In some ways, it sucks because it makes it harder to kind of distinguish that's fungi, that's plants. So honestly, you really... If I can't stress anything the most, I'm going to really stress, be sure to learn these life cycles forwards and backwards because it's going to be very easy to mix things up. So again, our diploid zygote growing into this diploid sporophyte. The sporangium is just a structure on this diploid sporophyte, so it's also diploid. Like nothing crazy has happened. This is all just part of that structure of the sporophyte. Similar to fungi, what we've already learned in our alternation of generations, inside of a sporangium, we get meiosis. Meiosis is then going to produce our spores. And because we underwent meiosis, these are haploid. And so what I'm going to do, um, I will use, uh, I'll use green. So inside this sporangium, I'm putting all these green dots representing the green spores that this sporangium is making, these haploid spores these sporangia are making, and we've done it. Like, guys, that's it. Gametophyte made gametes. Gametes came together to create the sporophyte. Sporophyte. Uh, sorry, sp <laughs> just zoned out there. <laughs> sporophyte makes spores. And then if you guys remember from the general alternation generation, spores grow into gametophytes. Now granted, something needs to happen. Similar to fungi, these spores, based on conditions, which what conditions are depends on the moss, these spores burst out. They burst out of that sporophyte, they burst out of that structure, the sporangium, and they get released into the environment. Here's some soil, some of those spores land, good conditions exist, and then we get more mosses. Get some males, get some females. Okay, we're gonna make a lot of ladies. Here's a male. And our cycle has started all over again. Okay, so I know <laughs> this is just like a cluster. The book image does a better job of drawing this more cyclically. Uh, and again, this only uses some of the keywords. It doesn't use all the words that are on um, the actual book version. Some key things that I do want to type on here, they are written on the slide themselves, um, but I'll type them here too. So as a reminder, um, moss relies on water for reproduction. That sperm has got to get 
to the egg. The only way sperm can move is in a liquid. So moss has to have H2O for reproduction. Another thing, there's something that we call independence and dependence. And, and what they mean, whether we're talking about plants or something else, is the same. If something is independent of something, that means like they can grow or do things by themselves. If something is dependent on something else, they can't do that. So we're going to use independence and dependence when talking about this sporophyte. So we use those terms to talk about is the sporophyte dependent on the gametophyte or is it independent of the gametophyte? Now I'm going to tell you the answer and then I'm going to explain it. And then in future life cycles, I'm going to kind of pause and be like, hey, what do we do? So the sporophyte is dependent. So what I mean by that, this sporophyte is literally growing on this gametophyte right here. It's literally growing on it. Here is that gametophyte leaf. Here is that archegonia. The sporophyte is literally a structure growing out of it. If I were to pluck that sporophyte off, that sporophyte would die. It is literally growing on the gametophyte. It has to have the gametophyte. Like it is 100% dependent on that gametophyte. It cannot live on its own. We're gonna examine this in other life cycles and see how it differs in other life cycles. The last thing that we can talk about is dominance. And I'll scroll a little bit down on here. So dominance. And what the question would be is which phase of the life cycle is dominant? And dominance really means what we see or what we primarily see. Like when you look at moss, what stage of the life cycle are you looking at? So I want you guys to reflect on it. Okay, I'm looking at this green moss. What stage of the life cycle are we looking at? Or what is the dominant stage of that life cycle? Hopefully what you said was the gametophyte. When we are looking at that green moss, we are looking at the gametophyte. So we would say that is the dominant stage in moss. All this green stuff, all of these, Gametophyte, 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 gametophyte. It's kind of cool in moss, you do see the sporophyte, but the sporophyte is a brown little structure. I'll show you a picture here soon. As a brown little structure, you see the green moss and you barely see that brown structure. So that is it for the life cycle of these guys. Uh, let me go ahead and um, change the picture real quick. So let's go here. So again, the book life cycle is organized a little bit better, but it just includes a lot of words that I don't really care about. Um, so be sure to kind of refer to the red words in the upper left corner. And again, you would not be left alone with these. I would give you these terms. The red boxes around here, um, again, they have to have water for reproduction. The dominant generation is the gametophyte. And then again, you notice there was no seeds anywhere in this life cycle. So just keep that in mind. Not all plants create seeds. Um, here is a picture, although it's a diagram, it's pretty close to what you see in real life, of that sporophyte growing out of the gametophyte. And it's very, you can actually see this with the naked eye, uh, which is kind of cool. So again, our seedless non-vascular plants, probably the first ones to evolve, they still have this dependency on water, but they do have some vascularization, very, very primitive vascularization, but kind of making and paving that way for further evolution on land.